Please open your Bibles this morning to the book of 1 Peter, the book of 1 Peter, and I ask that you follow along as we read from 1 Peter 5, 1 to 5. That's 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. Therefore I exhort you, elders, the elders among you, as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker in the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but providing to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You younger men, likewise, be subject, be sub, subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God opposed is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. May the Lord add his blessing to this, the reading of his word. Amen. Well, thank you, Brother Paul. I trust that your Bibles are still open there to the text we just read, 1 Peter chapter uh, 5. I know it's a, a little hard to believe, but uh, we're at the very end of our study. We're just two messages away. Today and next Sunday, we'll be wrapping up our study of 1 Peter. And uh, so hopefully it's been uh, a worthwhile study for you. I have enjoyed it immensely whether you've enjoyed it or not, I don't know, but I have enjoyed every second of it. Uh, Peter has uh, impressed me in so many ways. I've learned so much and been challenged, and uh, today's no exception. First Peter chapter 5, our text is verses 1 through 5. Uh, truthfully, uh, these verses could be an entire series in and of themselves. Uh, every word deserves its own message in, in some respects, but we're going to at least get the high points today and, and make sure that we get the main point of the text across uh, for our time this morning. So 1 Peter chapter 5, as we read, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> Kent Hughes tells the story of a church in Dallas, Texas from years ago. It was a divided congregation. Two groups within the church squared off and created this faction. And so much so, the conflict was so great, the two groups eventually entered into a lawsuit against one another. And in an effort for one of the groups to gain uh, possession of the church's property. Well, when the story went to court, it also went to press. And the news outlets started reporting on what was happening, and the Dallas community watched with great interest as this church was having a kind of civil war in the Lord's army as they fought with one another. The judge began to look at the case and did some things and eventually decided that the, the case was not a civil matter, but rather was a, a denominational matter. So he, he pointed it back to the denomination. And so the church leaders were called in, hearings were held, both sides presented their, their issues, and then eventually it was decided that a certain group in the church would receive the property and possession and not the other group. And it's probably not surprising the other group left the church. And they went a few blocks down the road and started their own congregation. Now we've all heard of church splits, but what struck me about this story as I read it was, was, was what actually was the cause of this church split. During the hearing, they were starting to trace back where did this all begin and what was the, the issue at the center of it, and they eventually found the root of the conflict. It, it turned out that this entire church split, and all the news that was in Dallas about this church, it all started because at a dinner, one of the elders was given a smaller piece of ham than a child sitting next to him. And the elder fussed and griped and complained and 
deacons griped and fussed and complained, and next thing you know, the whole church was fussing and griping and complaining about this. Can you imagine that? Talk about an unhealthy church. You know, if we went around the room, I'm sure many of you could share, maybe not stories that bad, but you've probably heard of stories of church fights and church struggles and conflicts, maybe even church splits. I've heard stories like that so many times, especially growing up as a pastor's kid and being in and around ministry. Sometimes I wonder to myself, is every church destined for problems like that? Is every church destined for conflict like that? And then I stop and ask myself maybe the most important question, is Forest Baptist Church destined for conflict and problems like that? I think the answer to that question depends in part on what we do with our passage today. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. In these verses here, Peter is going to remind us that God, when it comes to the church, God expects both the leadership and the membership to behave in a certain way. And God, in in these verses, through the, the, the words of the Apostle Peter, he is challenging every church to be a healthy church. And it doesn't matter if that church is in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, or Forest. Every church is expected by God to pursue the kind of harmony and like-mindedness and the the, the healthiness that Peter sets before us in this passage. And so the question is, will we, the, the leadership, the elders of our church, the membership, will we work together to be a, a healthy church? Or is it possible that one day we will be the kind of church that winds up in the newspaper, that winds up in the courts, that winds up as maybe even the laughing stock of the community. I certainly don't think we are headed in that direction, but I want to make sure that we never head in that direction. So what does a healthy church look like? Peter's going to set before us what are two key ingredients. For some of you, this may help you make sense of your past church experience in other places, by the way. You may stop and think, I wonder why that church had so... You you might find that Peter's actually addressing what some of those issues may be. And for all of us, it is a call to to think about what our part is in the ingredients here of a healthy church. Peter expects something of both the leadership and the membership, two essential ingredients. Number one, Peter tells us in verses 1 through 4, that in a healthy church, elders pastor with integrity. In a healthy church, elders pastor with integrity. Notice where the text begins, verse 1. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God among you. Now just pause there. Peter has just got done talking at the end of chapter 4 about some of the sufferings and challenges and hardships. And he knows that, that when those challenges come, when the lightning strikes and the thunder rumbles and the wolves come around the corner, that sheep, sheep oftentimes want to scatter. And so Peter, knowing that, that suffering and hardship and conflict is, is coming, if not already there, he gives an instruction to those that are the leaders of the sheep to tell them that you have a job to do in the persecution. You have a a role, a task to fulfill, and that is to shepherd, to pastor the flock. Throughout the letter, you will remember, Peter has addressed certain groups by name. Earlier, he talked to, to slaves. He talked to wives. He talked to husbands. Well, now Peter's turning his attention from the home to the church, and he speaks directly in verse 1 to the elders. 
last two days, Friday, Saturday, I was in North Carolina uh, performing a wedding for a couple in our church. And my daughter went with me. At Friday night at the rehearsal dinner, they had it at this real fancy restaurant, but the seating was kind of uh, crammed. It was a, a, we were all sitting close. And so it was a buffet, and the, the lady that was giving the instructions, she said, um, uh, now if you're here and you're, you're one of our senior adults and you need help or need someone to assist you to get to the, to the food, just raise your hand and someone will come help you. But then when she said it, she said, Though she said, if anyone here is an elder, just raise your hand. And my daughter went, oh, he's an elder, he's an elder. And she started pointing at me. She got excited thinking that I was going to get to go, uh, to go, to go first. Th- this word elder can be confusing to some because it does. It and sometimes carries the meaning of age. And sometimes it's a reference to one's office. Now those overlap, Certainly. If you go all the way back to Numbers 11, when God told Israel to set up the nation and their leadership, he said, set out some elders. They were older, wiser men that could help govern and oversee the nation. So it was both an office and uh, it implied age. Well, that pattern's picked up in the church. But here the focus is not as much on age. Again, although that's, that's generally implied, the, the focus is on the office of elder. By the way, we believe as a church, if you see our doctrinal statement, that Christ has established two offices in the church. Pastors, or elders, and deacons. Those are separate roles. They're not the same, though in many Baptist churches we blur those lines, unfortunately. They're they're separate roles, they're gifts to the church. You say, what's the difference between an elder and a deacon? In short, deacons lead the church by serving Elders serve the church by leading. That's that's the basic distinction that the New Testament gives. And sometimes when we blur those lines, we we get confused in how the church should operate. And here he is specifically saying the elders have a task to, they, they, they serve the church by leading it and by shepherding it. Notice first of all in there, he says, I exhort the elders. The word there is, it is plural. It's not to the elder of the church. Again, what started in the Old Testament is found throughout the New Testament. The clearest example of this is James chapter 5, verse 14. It says there, if anyone is sick, let him call for the elders, plural, of the church, singular. So it was assumed that the the congregation had a body of spiritual shepherds, leaders, to oversee them. And throughout the book of Acts and throughout the epistles, this, this pattern of a plurality of elders to shepherd the flock, that's what's seen. Our congregation, we have seven elders who work together in doing this. I know these men. I love these men. I love to hear them pray. I love to hear them agree. I love to hear them disagree. I love to hear them work together and to cooperate. I know and deeply appreciate these men, but that raises a question. Do you know and appreciate these men? Could you name our elders off the top of your head without cheating and looking in your bulletin this morning? Do you know who they are? Elders are given to the church for their good, as Peter says. And so Peter gives them instructions on how to do their job. Notice, he actually identifies himself in verse 1 as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ. So Peter says, he identifies himself, he says, on the one hand, he reminds them, I'm also a pastor. On the other hand, he says, I'm also an apostle. You see that? There's a bit of camaraderie here and a little bit of authority here. I'm in the trenches with you guys. I get the job. I understand the work that you're trying to do, so let me keep you focused as someone doing the same work, but also understand that I'm here speaking to you as someone who was there on Good Friday, someone commissioned by Christ to to speak with this kind of authority. And then he says at the end of verse 1, he calls himself a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. I was looking at that phrase and thought about it. You ever noticed how so many cartoons about heaven have Peter standing at the gate? You know, like jokes about heaven, there's always St. Peter standing. I don't know if that's the keys of the kingdom or a Catholic thing, I don't know. But like it's always Peter standing there at the gate. And I was thinking about that, and I thought, it it sort of almost gives the impression, if you just were looking at that cartoon and that was your source of theology, it gives the impression that Peter's the gatekeeper. He's the one handing out the glory. But look what he says in verse 1. 
He calls himself not a distributor of the glory of Christ, but a fellow partaker in the glory of Christ. Peter is not the one handing out Christ's glory. He too was hoping and trusting in Christ's glory. And Peter is aware of his frailty, that he himself is a sheep of the the good shepherd, and he's longing for that day. And so with that in mind, Peter then tells the elders what to do. Verse 2, here's the verb, shepherd the flock of God. That is the key command here, shepherd the flock. Now that raises a really, really interesting but simple question. So let me ask a really simple question, all right? Just don't answer out loud, just think to yourself. What is a pastor? Just think about it. What is a pastor? And and I want you to consider the fact, if you have a different answer from that question than I have, one of us is going to get frustrated. Right? Isn't that how marriage works? Right? If you've got different expectations, but you don't communicate what a husband does, what a wife does, eventually you're going to do this. And so if a pastor is thinking, this is what a pastor is, and the congregation is thinking, no, this is what a pastor is, if you're all on the same page. So it's a good question. What is a pastor? Some people think today that a, that a pastor is a visionary CEO, someone that, that runs a kind of kingdom corporation to try to get it bigger and bigger. Others think of pastors as like motivational speakers or sort of uh, gurus of godliness just to to charge your batteries and send you out for a new week. Other people think of pastors as just like community, you know, quaint chaplains. Oh, they just hang around to marry and bury people. They have no bearing on my life. In fact, I don't want them to have a bearing until those key moments come. I don't want them to speak to me. I just want them to sort of hang around until I, I call for them. What is a pastor? Well, ultimately, it doesn't matter what you think or what I think. What matters is what God thinks. And God says what? A pastor shepherds the flock of God. That's the answer to the question. A pastor, an elder, is a shepherd. It's someone who gives of themselves to care for the souls of men and women. They're they're not simply there to, to, to put on a show. They're not simply there to sort of impress you with their oratorical skills. They're there to disciple you and to guide you and to shepherd you towards towards the good shepherd so that you might better know him. If you want my philosophy of pastoral work in four words, I didn't come up with this. I wish I had. But what does it mean to shepherd it? Four words, preach, pray, love, stay. That's what I plan to do. Preach, pray, love, stay. And I think those four qualities are are sort of assumed in what he says here, that that elders are to shepherd the flock of God. I don't have to really give an illustration. I thought about it this week. The illustration's right there. Think about David. What did David do with his sheep? He led them beside still waters. He led them into green pastures. He helped them to rest. He put himself between the sheep and the the lion and the bear and and, and killed them with his bare hands. He he was willing at at times even to to leave the flock to go after the one that was straying. Why? Because that that sheep was in danger. That's what a shepherd does for the sheep. He cares for their souls. And that's what our elders are seeking to do for you as as a church. If an elder calls upon you or, or stops to ask you a question, they're not being nosy. They care for your soul. And our conversations as elders is not about what can we do to make some grand, big, visionary. No, it's how do we help people grow in the image and the likeness of Christ? Because that's what Peter says. You shepherd the flock. Notice he says, shepherd the flock of God among you. Now, I'm going to spend a little time on this two-word phrase because I, think, I actually think it's really, really applicable to where we are today. Not our church, but just church in general in this sense. 
Look at, look at that. Shepherd the flock of God among you. Now watch this. Peter's writing to multiple congregations. If you remember, chapter 1, verse 1, the church is Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. But when he writes this, shepherd the flock of God, watch this, among you, he's telling the shepherds at Pontus to focus on the sheep, the flock at Pontus. Right? And vice versa. Imagine the flock at Pontus running off to ask the elders, the, 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 the shepherds of Bithynia, what they thought best. Or, or running to the elders and shepherds of Cappadocia. What do you guys think? No, no, no. The, the encouragement was you make sure that you listen to the elders among you and, the, and, and, and focus on the sheep among you. My point is, I think just given the world we live in today, there is a huge temptation for us to turn to other shepherds than the shepherds given to us by Christ. YouTube, Facebook, podcasts. Can I ask a really practical question? When you have a question or you need spiritual guidance, you need wisdom, counsel, you, you need some direction, is your first impulse, is your first impulse to pick up your phone and to Google John MacArthur, or is it to pick up your phone and call Paul Boatner? Or to call Steve Putney? Or, or to call Mark Hernandez? That's what he's saying here. Christ has put shepherds in your lives. We don't need pixelated pastors who don't know you. You need flesh and blood pastors who know you, who spend time with you, who would pray with you. That, that's what he says here. Shepherd the flock of God among you. Now, by the way, let me just balance out what I just said. We pastors are part of the problem, a big part of the problem. Because a lot of pastors, we like to spend time talking about the church and not focusing on their church. That's a difference. And where I have been guilty of that, please forgive me. Because I am not called by God to shepherd every church in Virginia or America. God has called me to help shepherd this church. And I want to spend the next 30 years or however many God gives me shepherding this flock. I, 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 this week I was talking to a buddy, and he said, you going to Na uh, the Southern Baptist Conventions in Nashville? He said, you going to Nashville? Am I going to see you in Nashville? And I said, yeah, I'll see you there. And jokingly, he said, well, I'll be getting up and nominating you to be president of the Southern Baptist Convention. And I said, if you do, I will never talk to you ever again. <laughs> My point being, we were laughing, I said, I've got 486 souls that are my responsibility. I don't need 16 million to worry about. I have a hard enough time with 486. Peter says, elders, shepherd the flock. He is encouraging the leadership to focus on their membership and for the membership to focus on their leadership. This is one of the reasons why we do talk about membership so much as a church. Not because uh, we're just trying to get big numbers. That has nothing to do with it. We need the elders to know who do they go after. Who do we actually shepherd? And who's just passing through from one flock to the next, just kind of moving on for the flavor of the month kind of thing. This allows us to be able to know, and it defines our job. Who do we pray for? Who do we go after? He says here, shepherd the flock of God among you. By the way, I asked a question, what is a pastor? It raises another interesting question here. What is a church? Notice Peter doesn't describe the church as a business or a seminary. Look what he says there. Shepherd the flock of God. You're not a consumer this morning. You're not a spectator this morning. Just here to watch the show. You are a sheep in Christ's flock. And as such, you need to be someone to watch out for your soul, to help care for you and guide you through the hills and valleys and the dark seasons of life. But Paul, Peter's words here remind me of Paul's words to the elders at Ephesus in Acts chapter 20. He says in verse 28, he tells them, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, listen to this, which he purchased with his own blood. 
the flock is not my flock. It's not our flock. This is God's flock. And so Peter says here, understand that your relationship to the elders is a relationship such that it points ultimately to your relationship to Christ. Which, by the way, that is the cornerstone of who we are as a church. That is the gospel itself. What, in other words, the church is a gospel community. We're not a business, we're not a seminary or a Bible institute. We are men and women who are redeemed through repentance and faith in the blood of Christ and called to encourage one another to be disciples who make disciples who make more disciples. We do not rally around just the pastor's vision. We rally around the Savior's blood. And that's the focus. And so he says you are a flock purchased by Christ and cared for by Christ through the shepherds that he has placed among you. So how do elders shepherd the flock how how do pastors oversee the church well look what he says there in verse 2 shepherd the flock of god among you now he defines it exercising oversight exercising so this is how they shepherd is by exercising oversight this reminds me of that christmas verse luke chapter 2 verse 8 you remember the verse in the same region there were some shepherds Staying out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Boy, that's a a pastoral ministry class 101. Watch over your flocks even at night. So when he says there that they are to exercise oversight, it's a call for for the shepherds to look out for the good of the entire body. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but, but Peter does something interesting here. If you look in your Bible, verse 1, he calls them elders. Verse 2, he tells them to shepherd, or that's the word pastor, and then he tells them to exercise oversight. There's three words here kind of bumping into each other like bumper cars. It's the word elder, pastor, and overseer. Or if you've got a King James Bible, it'll say bishop, right? Peter is using these words interchangeably, synonymously. Acts chapter 20, the Bible does the same thing. So if I can say it this way, just to help you be clear, in Scripture, a pastor is an elder, is an overseer, is a bishop. Therefore, moving forward, you need to all call me Bishop J.T. Scarlett. No, I'm just kidding. I will, we, won't, we, won't, we won't do that. What what does it mean? It's it's not three different jobs. It's the same job. The term elder implies their character. The term pastor implies the work. And and the term uh, overseer implies their authority, their spiritual authority. And he's saying all three are part of their job and their task. So if we're expecting the elders or pastors of the church to, to build some mega spiritual corporation, you're probably going to be disappointed. Because that's not the primary job. The job is to shepherd the flock of God. If God gives the increase, praise God. We will work with that. But we shepherd the sheep that he's given to us. Now, how is it that they exercise oversight? Peter then gives three couplets, right? Three little phrases, and we won't spend a lot of time on these, but three little couplets to define how elders exercise oversight, okay? Couplet number one He says, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God. Now, by the way, these right here are important. If some of you young men aspire to be elders, some of uh, you in the room, you are elders and you exercise this oversight, and all of us are under this oversight. So it's important to know what should be expected of those doing this. So he says, first, they exercise oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily. If I can just be blunt, you don't go into ministry because mama thinks you'd make a cute pastor. It's not compulsion. It's not because your wife thinks you'd be good at it. It's not because your pastor even thinks you'd be good at it. You go into vocational ministry because God expects you to do it. We shouldn't twist people's arms to go to seminary. But those who raise their arms in willingness to volunteer, we should encourage, he says, those that do it voluntarily. 
I didn't know a whole lot when I was 16 years of age. I was still sorting out life and myself. And I cannot explain it to you, but I had absolute, total peace and clarity at 16 years of age that God was calling me to be a pastor. I don't know how. I just know with certainty he was. And I raised my hand and said, God, I volunteer. If you would have me do this, and for any young man in the room that feels that particular calling, listen, you need to raise your hand and volunteer. You need to, to meet with one of our elders and let them know and spend time with them so they can help you because not everyone who feels called is called. Notice he says, according to the will of God. So it's not just the internal, there's also the external, and the church has a job, has a part in doing that. This is why we report those that are, we're sending off to seminary. Well, that's it's just a clerical thing. No, because the church is responsible for those that are going to shepherd our children and grandchildren. We should be mindful of those that we want in leadership and look at their character and to, to be mindful of what they're doing. So he says, not under compulsion. Number two, he says, not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. Not for sordid gain. The King James here has one of my favorite phrases in the whole King James Bible. It says, not for filthy lucre. Isn't that a great phrase? If I quit ministry and go into gangster rap, that's going to be my stage name, filthy lucre. That's a, what a, that's weird. Why did I say that? That's a, what a, what a phrase. What, okay, what does that mean, Filthy, all right, what does this mean, sordid gain? Well, it, it implies, and I think Scripture elsewhere teaches, that, that, some, that elders can be paid for their job. Paul speaks of those that, that preach and teach they're deserving of double honor in the church. But Peter's point here is, they shouldn't, he means they shouldn't do it for shameful money. They shouldn't be sleazy preachers just trying to make a quick buck off of people's spiritual inclinations. But Peter's literally condemning here the health and wealth hucksters who think every offering is a love offering for them. 1 Timothy 3.3 3 says what? That an elder should not be a lover of money. But instead, what should elders do? They should do the job, notice, with eagerness. It implies a willingness, whether they're paid or not, whether there is gain in it or not, they're willing to do this. By the way, that word eagerness, I think, is, is instructive to every one of us in the room. Whenever we are looking for elder candidates, and we're not currently, but in the years ahead as elders rotate off, we will need to do that. Just a little tip for you, this is my own personal practice. I do not ask myself who would make a good elder. I ask myself, who is acting like a good elder? The, the church doesn't make elders. The church identifies Christ's elders. Those that the Holy Spirit has set apart in service to his people. And this word eagerness implies they'll be doing it whether they have a title, whether they have a paycheck, whether they have any of that or not. They care about souls. So he says, do it eagerly. And then the third couplet there, verse 3, nor yet is lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. Peter is clear here that pastors are overseers, not overlords. It echoes Mark 10. Remember Jesus said, you, you know that the, the leaders of the Gentiles, they lord it over you, right? So some of the worst managers are micromanagers. Peter says that's not what it's called by the elders. Elders are not tyrants of the church. They're not dictators. Elders are not spiritual bosses. They are spiritual guides. And notice he says there, they prove to be examples. A, a true elder doesn't ask to be an example. He just is one. He proves it. Which, which goes to show that elders teach the church, yes, through their lessons, but also through their lives. And so for the young men aspiring to me, listen, Bible knowledge is not enough to be an elder. Degrees and sort of, you know, being able to pass the test, that's not enough. Reading the books is not enough. That's important. But discipline and godliness and holiness and virtue and the fruit of the Spirit, the, the kind of life that's an example to the flock. I'm, I'm sure I'm taking this too far, but I was thinking to myself, instead of encouraging our kids to have posters of, of Tom Brady 
or, or, or LeBron James. Maybe we should have posters of Joe Vera's, you know, on all of our kids' bedrooms. Okay, maybe, maybe not, maybe not. But, but maybe I'm on to something. Sh- shouldn't elders be the role models for our children? If we want them to grow up and be like someone, shouldn't we point them to the men shepherding the church? He says they proved to be examples. So you put it all together, verses 1 to 3, what's the point? Peter basically says that the elders are to pastor the church with integrity. All of these phrases are implying integrity. Integrity means that their calling is sure, that their motives are pure, and their life is mature. And he says, the elders who do that, notice the promise he holds out in verse 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. He mentions here the chief shepherd. That can, can literally be translated also as senior pastor. That's why I don't use that title for myself. I never have and I never will. Because when he shows up, I don't want his nameplate on my desk. I'm an under shepherd. But Christ is the senior pastor. He's the chief shepherd. And we ultimately look to him. And he says, when he returns, he will see those elders that are serving well, who are serving with integrity. And notice, he says, they will receive the unfading crown of glory, a wreath of glory, a a symbol that says, well done. It was an award given to a man that ran a, a marathon or a long race, and they completed the race. He says, this gift will be given to them from Christ himself. And so Peter says that the elders of the church are to what? They're to shepherd under the direction of the chief shepherd. They're to watch out for the souls of the flock. I'm reading a book right now, and the author of the book says, quote, pastors are nothing more than errand boys for Jesus. I like that. I think that's the calling. It's not some grand, massive sort of business conglomerate. It's Aaron boys for Jesus to shepherd the flock to grow, to help marriages flourish, to see young people know God's calling and in their vocation to honor Christ, whether they're lawyers or missionaries or doctors or teachers. It's to sit with parents in their, the heartache of a child who wanders from the faith and to help them, to sit at people's bedside as they, as they go through the pain of maybe their last few moments here on earth and to comfort their family, to shepherd the flock of God. That's what a healthy church needs. That's not the only ingredient Peter speaks to, though. Number two, he tells us, in a healthy church, everyone practices humility. Elders pastor with integrity, but everyone practices humility. Notice verse 5, you younger men, so he turns his attention here from the elders, likewise be subject to your elders, and then notice this, and all of you Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Peter speaks here to the younger men. It may be the younger men who, who might have wanted to be elders or, or in that role. We would might say the college and career class. Usually in the Jewish synagogue, you couldn't be an elder till 30. So those under that age group, young men tend to be impulsive and short-sighted and naive. And so the command here seems to be, you younger men who need maturity, come up under those men who already have maturity. Submit to them and learn from them and grow from them. Peter says here, don't don't undercut them. In fact, he says, be subject to them. So he quite literally says here, younger people, respect your elders. Don't undermine them, don't undercut them, but rather submit to them and be subject to them. This is not just for young people. Hebrews 13, 17 says the same to the whole church. Obey your leaders and submit to those who watch out for your souls. I'm thankful that our church does that, that our church has assumed that posture, and I pray that we continue to assume that posture because it seems to me that in far too many churches there is an undercurrent of suspicion about the leadership. They're out to get us. They're out to do something. My friends, Christ has given elders for the good of the church. Not to be combative with the church, but to see us flourish. 
And so he says, if you're going to do that, notice what he says in the end of verse 5. And all of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. Peter, no doubt, is remembering that night when Christ himself took an apron or a towel and he tied it around his waist and he knelt down in the dirt with a bowl of water and what? He washed the disciples' feet. Christ clothed himself in meekness and lowliness and humility of mind and said, I'm leaving you an example that you would do this one for another. He says there, have humility towards one another. This is elders towards other elders. This is elders towards the members. Members to elders, members to members, younger to older, older to younger. It's assumed this is everyone's job in the flock to make sure that you show humility to each other. Years ago, my brother and I were driving to Washington, D.C. in his car, and uh, on the way there, all of a sudden, the car started shimmying and shaking, and the, all the lights on the dashboard came on, and all of a sudden, the car just came to a grinding, like the engine just cut off completely, and we kind of coasted to the side, and it was just a giant paperweight, like we couldn't get to start, couldn't move, nothing. So we got the car towed, and later discovered that this car, this used car he had, he had no idea it had an oil leak. And so we'd been driving on this trip, and, and, and for whatever, 100 miles, whatever, it had slowly been leaking oil to the point that on the middle of the interstate, it completely ran out. And the engine completely, it just seized up. It, it got so hot, those pistons firing, the whole thing just, and the entire engine just stopped working and could not be repaired. What's my point? My point is, humility is to a congregation what oil is to a car engine. It is the thing that keeps the overall temperature down. It reduces the friction. It allows things to run smoothly because without it, that's when sparks fly and temperatures rise and the danger and the damage is often irreparable. So he says here, Everyone needs to operate in a spirit of humility. Why would we do that? Because look at the end of verse 5. Because God is opposed to the proud. Now think about that. It's one thing to have an enemy against you. It's another thing to have a neighbor against you. Imagine you look across battle lines and there's God lined up against you. Well, that's not good. And he says you, you set yourself up against God if you operate out of pride, out of selfishness. Out, out of that, that mindset, God is unhappy when we hold our doctrine with smugness and arrogance. He's not at work there. God is unhappy when we adopt an independent spirit that says, well, no, no elder's going to tell me what to do. God is unhappy when we refuse to apologize or to admit our wrongs because I'm not going to eat crow. God is opposed to the proud. He doesn't operate there. He doesn't work there. And the same is true for elders. God is against arrogant elders, the kind of man that would complain about the size of ham he gets at a church dinner. Or those elders who would use their position to prey on the people for their own benefit, for their own satisfaction, for their own uses. Peter says, God is opposed to the proud, but what? He gives grace to the humble. I love how that's written there. If the elders do their job, watch. What do they get? They get a crown. But if all of us do our job, we also get something that's what? We get grace. We get God's grace. And my friends, that is what a healthy church is built on. That's the secret sauce is grace. See, we are not only to preach grace and to sing about grace, but we are to show grace to live by grace, to experience grace, to extend grace, to, the grace to forgive each other, the grace to, to apologize, the grace to give up a Saturday to serve a fellow church member, the grace to, to orient our lives towards the good that God has given to us in the flock one to another, the grace to be corrected, the grace to give correction, the grace that says, I don't deserve what God's given to me but I'm going to receive it, receive it with gratitude. Everyone is called to practice humility, and we are all called to walk in grace together. So what does it take to be a healthy church? Well, there's probably more than this. 
but I'm convinced there's not less than this. Elders should pastor with integrity, and every single one of us should give ourselves to humility.